Stupid car manufacturer trends that need to stop. Disclaimer, all anger displayed in this video is overplayed for the sake of humor, for the most part at least. Delayed speedometers. Manufacturers that do this, they claim to delay so that the numbers aren't moving so fast that our eyes can't keep up. Whether it's Chevrolet or Ferraris, the reasoning for this is just a load of bullcrap just to compensate for bad software engineering. Play video games, you boomers. Literally anyone who has played any racing game, even a garbage mobile one, would be able to elaborate thoroughly how our human eyes can indeed keep up with the rapid throwing of numbers. and I will be able to tell you exactly what speed I am going at the moment. This isn't some Herculean skill I've developed over decades, this is something I was capable of at literally 6 years old. It's one of those things that sounds great on paper, but it's horrendous in application. Having delayed numbers of anything is far more difficult for our brain and eyes to keep up with. My Corvette, at times, can have variances as large as 7 miles per hour depending on how fast I'm accelerating. At super high speeds, like 170, that doesn't make too much difference, but at lower speeds, that makes all the world's difference, because whether I'm going 35 or 42 is the difference between if Officer Billy Bob Joe decides to pull me over or continue his afternoon donut munching session. And even for high performance driving, this is a nightmare, as the delay will still exist when decelerating, so when I enter my braking zones, I'm better off kissing my ass and winging at each attempt instead of trying to remember what speed I first entered the course corner in. Cause if I see my speedometer tell me that I entered the corner at 50 miles an hour, for all I know that could either mean I'm going 43 or 57. The C8 still has this issue, albeit it's now only like a 3 to 5 mile variance. The point is, it's still delayed. So go suck a fat one GM designers, and while you're at it, YouTube Ferrari and any other degenerate company that thinks this is a good idea. Kudos to Dodge designers, because like the college frat boys that they're constantly made fun of for, at least that means that they have young people working in their company, and these young people have actually played video games and understand the fact that the proper solution for this is to just show the exact number, the exact instant it's achieved. Run flat tires and low profile tires and big rims. All of these three are usually done in unison by manufacturers. I'm not going to make them separate entries for that reason. And it's super common in today's automotive world. And the main purpose for doing it is to just look cool. To which my response is to who? Certainly not these potholes, I'll tell you. If you like stupidly big rims and non-existent tire sidewall, more power to you. But nowadays, it's like we don't even have a choice. People who don't like those things still have to deal with them because manufacturers are shoving them down our throats. Bent wheel here, bent wheel there, tire sidewall punctured and hissing air. What a headache. I genuinely could care less about the style of wheels and just so on and so forth. I just want them to be strong, lightweight, and roll. One of my favorite columns written from Doug is his rant about black wheels. And I agree with him for all the wrong reasons, because everything that he hates about black wheels is everything that I love about black wheels. Basically, from his viewpoint, he hates how they hide the spoke design, which is exactly why I love them, because I could care so little about the style of my wheels, that's why I want black, so people stop asking here and there. And run flats make even less sense to me. I'd rather have a spare or heck sit on the side of the road than to deal with run flats. And funnily enough, Regular tires hardly ever get to that point. Back when I owned my Mustang GT, I had four punctures in less than a year, on separate tires of course, but basically every single tire in that car had gotten punctured. But guess what? I just limped to the tire shop each time it happened. Took 30 minutes at most, and I was back on the road. Meanwhile, for run flats, they aren't repairable. And heaven forbid that the mom and pop shop that you're forced to stop at has the gargantuan 335 signs that my Z06 drives on. So now I'm forced to book a hotel wait the night the shop just gonna have to order a new set of tires because they can't just repair it obviously so it has to be straight up replaced and it definitely bogs down my road trip and speaking of which the repairs are just the beginning because things like the ride quality also sucks but run flat tires even on soft luxury cars can turn them into a nightmare because they're just so stiff for no reason and it doesn't just beat up your butt it will beat the heck up out of your wheels here I thought forged wheels were immortal and practically immune to bending 
ending, which under normal circumstances they basically are, but if you've got a run flat that also barely has any sidewall to it, you can kiss those 10 grand set of wheels goodbye. I think all the conveniences of run flats are so heavily outweighed by all the inconveniences they bring. It's no wonder why so many BMW and Corvette owners just go back to having normal tires. It just screams greed to me. They want to sell you a tire that isn't repairable, so you're either forced to buy a warranty or risk dropping $400 every time you get a nail in it or slightly graze a pothole. If you're looking to save money and also save the environment so you're not constantly wasting whole new tire each time you get a freaking nail in it, and you also want to ride softer and look cooler, then just ditch run flats and also miss low sidewall tires. Shell cars. Give us a running prototype for fuck's sake. It's getting more difficult to get excited over brand new supercars and hypercars that are supposed to be these marvel of technological whatever the hells because every time they're unveiled to us, it's just an empty shell car that also, insult injury, has 5% limo tin so you can't even see the interior because, spoiler alert, there is no interior. It's not finished. There's no powertrain, there's no suspension, there's nothing. These cars are sometimes just carted around from show to show, put on trailers and then so on and so forth and it's just a company showing it off and they have the audacity to even slam signs next to their shell cars that say five bajillion horsepower groundbreaking technology that uses the tears of jesus christ and the jizz of godzilla to give you the world's fastest accelerating car from zero to 62 seconds and a top speed of 300 bajillion miles per hour like these cars are built to attract non-car guy investors who know nothing of engineering and technology in hopes that they're naive enough to believe the figures on just that alone Fortunately, non-car people are actually really stingy, especially the investors, because non-car guy investors are by no means stupid. They've been involved in other fields of investment in business, so much so that they've probably already encountered this type of investment scam in a different type of area in another form. Shell cars are just the classic over-promise, under-deliver thing that we've just seen all over the ages. It's basically a way to make a quick buck. You tell someone you're going to give them this super awesome product, so they throw all these millions at you, and then you're like, well, actually, turns out we can't do it like that, so here's something instead, and it's like half the value of what you got. But unfortunately, because of the internet these days, you now have all these nine-year-old fledgling enthusiasts who don't even own cars pop a twig every time they see shell cars on YouTube when their favorite vlogger goes to Geneva because, herder, these cars are unique and everyone has to support them. Otherwise, you are a hater. I hate the use of the word hater. I guess that makes me a hater. Anyways, these days, people use the word hater way too much. It's used as a false shield against true criticism. And the criticism I have for these companies would be as follows. Just because you're making something that looks unique, it doesn't mean it's going to be useful. Uniqueness alone should never sell a product. Where non-car guy investors are stingy with their money, car guy investors are stingy with their faith. It's extremely hard to impress us. We're not nearly foolish enough to back a car that makes outlandish claims, but literally has nothing more than an empty shell to show for it that only impresses kids. These shell car companies are just a different kind of ricer to me, one that just so happens to have a dream, quote unquote, and most of the times they're just doing this to scam people, but in the end there's still a ricer, because put up or shut up. If you look at the most successful modern supercar and hypercar manufacturers, you'll see that they had humble beginnings. They started off as tuners, like Koenigsegg, for example, worked on Ford engines. Other than that, like Remock, for example, had failed prototype after failed prototype before they even thought of unveiling a fully built and house all original running prototype to the general public. These companies, Remock, Koenigsegg, McLaren, and even old players like Bugatti, they've all shed blood, sweat, and tears before even showcasing a prototype to the world. Their prototypes weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination because a lot of them, like Koenigsegg in the early days, didn't even make fully built in house ones. They used Ford engines and they were a far cry from what they could have been, but guess what? They moved. As car enthusiasts, we are attracted to the animation of vehicles. We desire more than anything to drive them. You want to give us an empty piece of art to stare at? Don't even bother with a shell car, just give us a drawing. In today's day and age, there are so many supercar manufacturers, that's probably why these wannabe supercar entrepreneur startups think they can take a bite off the growing market. But they're too foolish to realize that the more companies there are, the more buyers there are, it's actually led to more competition and, especially from the buyer standpoint, more education. YouTube, more than ever, has allowed people to actually see the ins and outs of supercars. 
that people have these ridiculous expectations, even for prototypes. So why should I place any faith in a shell car that literally has nothing to show for it, yet it still has absurd claims? Especially when you have real companies putting out proper products like McLaren, Ferrari, Lamborghini, BMW, Audi, and even Chevro fucking Lay are making supercars now. You can go, you know, people used to make fun of the Corvette for being a redneck trail of parking, but guess what? Even that's a supercar now. You have such a high bar to measure up to as one of these upcoming startup entrepreneur supercar companies that I think if you're in the shell car phase, do not show it to the public. Get a running prototype. And by running prototype, for the love of God, stop throwing LSs in them. And if you do throw LS in them, say it's a temporary phase because the amount of cars that supercars, quote unquote, that have Corvette engines in them, whether it's an LS or LT, and then overprice it to high hell is probably just as criminal as the shell car market. Because unlike shell cars, which don't actually go anywhere, these supercar quote unquote can actually get sold for like five to ten times the price of the Corvette just because they're mid engine, even if they have a bone stock LS and LT like the Onyx Sazen and so on and so forth. And I'm so glad an actual mid engine Corvette exists now because for a good price also. So now these lazy LS LT based supercar companies will sink to the abyss just like all the other shell cars because now you can actually buy a mid-engine corvette what the heck do you need to spend like 200 300 grand on a european designed shell car that just so happens to have a lslt mid-engine placement in it so it's an over glorified corvette kit car essentially look i love the corvette obviously i own one so i'm not making fun of it when i say this but it shouldn't be that high of a price for what is essentially a bone stock lslt engine that's part of the reason why like the hennessy venom got away with the price it did because that thing set a world record at the time of unveiling obviously now the car is outdated but you get the point in its time it wasn't just a bone stock ls it was a heavily tuned one that's why koenigsegg can get away with using a ford engine because again it's not bone stock heavily tuned before i get too angry the one thing that did make me really happy is that a lot of these companies have gone silent in the past year and that's due to the fact that one quarantine so they couldn't go to geneva two bugatti and ford broke the 300 mile an hour barrier and Ford did it with a modified GT, Bugatti did it with a modified Chiron. Both of those companies used modified variants of their car, but guess what? I don't care. I still think that's amazing because it's in street cars. This isn't some literal jet engine powered rocket that storms through the desert like the days of old. We actually have nor somewhat normal looking cars that are breaking the 300 mile an hour barrier. So they're not like big drag cars either that are like so injected with all these insane stuff that's going to blow up the car in 10 seconds, but it doesn't matter because the car went over 300. These are cars that actually could sustain 300 for more than 10 seconds, and they, they still look like normal cars. They don't have super big, you get the point I'm trying to say. This stomped out so many wannabe supercar manufacturers because do you know how many of them from 2012 all the way to 2018 kept using the we're gonna be the first to 300 miles an hour or support us on our race to 300 miles an hour invest in us now and get our newest try hard edgelord gtr xxxk batmobile super duper high tech mobile that's gonna zoom past 315 even though we have nothing to show for it except for a shell car so now that the engineers of both those companies respectively have worked tirelessly through the decades, heck, if you think about it, Ford and Bugatti are basically a century old, they just now broke the 300 mile hour barrier. So do you really think I'm going to invest in some cockatoo Phil in his shiny little shell car who brags about getting 300 or someday achieving it when these century long companies just now did it? And that's not to say young companies have no chance at getting it, because if they show enough effort i will believe them if koenigsegg is like hey we're gonna do it too i'll take that at face value if remock even told me that i'd also take it at face value based on their current results if you talk a big game you have to have big results and while the results will never be as high as you initially expect when you first make a car that's okay just make a car make something that moves Fake exhaust tips. So the main purpose of fake exhaust tips is so you can keep your tips nice and shiny, except not really since now they all have these stupid holes cut in them for drainage. So even though the outside fake tip looks shiny, it's accompanied by this dinky, grime-covered smaller tip that's hiding inside of it. It kind of reminds you of like the tongues that aliens have. This whole hidden aspect of a smaller thing and a larger thing, it just seems uncanny and disingenuous and lazy. 
fake exhaust tips to me just seem like a really strange way to gain weight in a day where cars are getting heavier and heavier yet they're so quick to pat themselves on the back for losing 50 or so pounds then charge you a hefty markup and then market that as the super duper sporty model because it's 50 pounds lighter yet it still has fake exhaust tips and you would think that'd be on their list of removal and while we're on the topic of fake things, fake vents, because they look cool. That's why most cars have fake vents these days. Imagine if every other manufacturer in other areas did this exact excuse, and everything else in life also had fake vents and had the audacity to market it in such a manner where it was acceptable. So let's say you're going out to buy a new property. So you inspect the house, you turn on the AC, and you realize that the AC system does indeed work and turn on, except that nothing is blowing out because none of the vents are actually real. They're all fake. And while you're continuing the tour, you realize that everything else that's remotely shaped or functions similarly to a vent is also just fake. The windows, they're just paintings on the wall. The kitchen ventilators, just a sculpture. Turns out the reason the house was for sale wasn't because the previous owner sold it, but because he straight up died. And now there you are, lying right next to him as you suffocate from asphyxiation due to the lack of airflow because some stupid ass designer decided to make all the vents fake but hey at least the house looks cool am i right Except no, since fake vents don't even remotely look cool. I'd rather the fiberglass just be smooth. If you're gonna make a fake vent, don't, just don't. Like, Lexus, I love what they did to the RCF on its rear. It looks like they could have included a rear brake vent there. But then when they realized it wasn't in their budget to do so, to make a functional one there, they just smoothed the fiberglass there. They're just like, whatever, it's smoothed, that's how it's gonna be. And from an aerodynamic standpoint, this is actually better because you have a smooth surface instead of a fake indentation that, if anything, makes your aerodynamics worse. So despite trying to look sportier with fake vents, they're actually making the sportiness of the car worse as they're now creating more drag, slowing it down and getting you worse gas mileage. It's almost as if the whole point of a vent is to have air pass through it in order to increase aero and not just have air run into the, pla the indentations is what I'm saying. It's just going to run into stupid indentations at that point it's better to smooth it out and have the air go around it good job auto manufacturers fan fucking tastic and finally destroying reputable nameplates mustang suv eclipse suv hotel also suv bitch you thought i was gonna say trivago you know damn well at the rate this world is moving their company may as well start selling suvs too to use an analogy let's talk about how nameplates work elsewhere in the world of video games, when you buy a sequel, you expect it to represent its predecessor in some manner. If you buy a Tekken game, you want fighting. If you buy Gran Turismo, you want a racing game. If you buy Super Smash Brothers, you want a wide, diverse roster that has characters from all kinds of video games, and not just Fire Emblem, because that's what you buy Fire Emblem for. Just kidding, I love you, Byleth. Now, the last thing you expect is for a game to carry the same nameplate, but then end up being a totally different experience. Like, the next Gran Turismo game isn't going to suddenly feature half-submarine boat trains wielding massive drills that turn into these huge mechs piercing the heavens trying to defeat the anti-spirals. It's still going to be a racing game because, you know, that's the expectation of the established nameplate Gran Turismo. In that same vein, manufacturers can't just kill a sports car nameplate that was well-known for several decades, like the Eclipse for example, and suddenly be like, yeah, it's an SUV now, which is a totally different categorization of automobile. That's like games jump genres. And before anyone misunderstands, I'm not saying that manufacturers can't make SUVs, they still can. Just name it something else. Like for example, if the developers of Gran Turismo wanted to make a game other than racing, they actually can, but they just have to release a new IP. That way they don't tarnish the current IP of Gran Turismo. And a lot of developers do in fact do this. They're like, hey, you know what? I want to dip my toes, make all kinds of different games. But this one that I had made that has made a lot of money and is successful, I won't touch that one. That one's known for this. That one's going to continue to be known for that. I'm going to make a different IP. That's why games like Metal Gear Survive failed. It took a beloved name and gave us an entirely different expectation. That's why the Eclipse crossover failed. Because again, it took a beloved nameplate of sports car and turned it into something entirely opposite of expectation. But unfortunately, I know the Mustang Mach-E is not going to fail because there are a bunch of Karens who get wet every time they hear the word Mustang, but know damn well they'll never own one because of the two divorces and four kids they have. But now, the Mustang Mach-E is around the corner, so they can finally buy their Mustang at the cost of not actually being a Mustang anymore. So did they really buy themselves the Mustang they dreamed of? No, there's still a horrible person who keeps having to juggle through multiple relationships. My only gripe is, just drop the Mustang moniker. You want to sell an electric SUV called Mach-E? Go for it. 
I'm fine with it. I'm not some uneducated twat who's selfishly desiring other people's lives to be destroyed and for the car to disappear because work has clearly been put into it and something has to sell. I, I just don't understand why car manufacturers can't grasp this because names more than anything actually mean a lot it's not just oh it's just a name because when you wake up every morning you go by a name you don't go by someone else's name you live your life responding and turning your head every time someone calls your name and you get scared when the teacher randomly calls your name in class when you don't have your hand up because they're a freaking dick like, you can't just look at PewDiePie's channel and be like, wow, he has over 100 million subscribers. I guess that means all I have to do is name my channel PewDiePie and I'll also get 100 million. Because that completely fails to realize that people are popular because of the personality embedded into their work and not just the name alone. Names don't really have any meaning until the person wielding the name makes it mean something and they earn a reputation. But when they earn that reputation, they have people now who expect them to uphold it and not suddenly betray us and that more than anything is what automotive manufacturers have failed to understand about the legacy and the weight that names carry that's why they see oh well we made a car called mustang and the mustang sells a lot i guess that just means we have to attach the word mustang to everything and the sales will go through the roof and that's why the supra was oh the supra was really loved in the past so we just gotta smack that nameplate and soar new taba there it goes and the nsx did the same thing and the eclipse did the same thing and do i really need to elaborate this that's not the simplicity of names those cars get they created a reputation that then garnered an audience and when that reputation wasn't upheld with the continuity of that name, of course we were disappointed. And of course the sales flopped. It wasn't, oh, well, it turns out people didn't actually like the Supra, or turns out people didn't actually like the NSX. We've just made a bad marketing decision. No, you made a bad philosophical decision. You didn't understand the literal point of names. And why they're attached to things. Why you show up to work to even make the decision in the first place and even tell... Like, why does the boss call you by your name and not your coworker's name? Why does your boss attribute your success to you and not your coworker? Because those are attached to your name. And this isn't some Herculean task above the hive mind that is a corporation. Because Honda is known for making reliable cars. What do they deliver? Reliable cars. The Chevrolet Corvette is known for being a low-slung two-door sports car. Guess what they deliver? The same thing. You know how many times that guy has been asked to make an SUV and he keeps saying, no, go buy a Chevrolet SUV. Why would we turn the Corvette into an SUV when we already have, have other Chevys that are SUVs? That is proof that corporations and these big wig executives can understand the philosophy in it because like i said it's not just a marketing decision but ford and many others just choose to be stupid i really don't have any other word to say it and now a lightning round of the twitter suggestion so exige b58 back at it again for a really good one which is that they don't like it when car manufacturers have this trend of understating power they mentioned bmw but to be fair a lot of german manufacturers do this especially porsche as well and you're probably thinking bladed how can this be a bad or stupid trend because you're getting more than what you paid for but you aren't really because the car is marketed so basically they fool automotive magazines by making them compare it against cars that it's much better than so let's say like some car has 300 horsepower and it actually has like 380 but bmw manages to lie that it only has 300 then it's going to be ranked in automotive magazines against other 300 horsepower cars and blow them out of the water and it's going to completely destroy them but guess what it's also going to be more expensive than them in short, what I'm trying to say about manufacturers understating power numbers is basically it's their way of getting their models into cross shoppers crosshairs. Basically, if you're someone who's cross shopping between like cars that are just in the 300 horsepower range, you will then stumble across their car that is actually a 400 horsepower car, but you will now be looking at it and they can upsell you it for its additional price because they fooled you into thinking it's within the same range you shopped in. And this slowly isn't working as well in today's day and age due to the fact that people actually have access to dinos and internet results where people will actually share that you're just being swindled in a different kind of way. And I know someone watching this video has like bought a car for this exact reason. It's a pleasant surprise at least. 
like, oh, ha ha, I took out like 12K more for a loan than I didn't need to, but at least my car has 80 more horsepower than I expected. But is that 80 horsepower really worth the 12 grand loan when you could have just modded that for much cheaper on some other car? So that's kind of the argument I'm making. I personally think just say numbers the way they're advertised. Any type of lying, whether it's lesser or greater, I think is bad. Just be honest. And then introspective son. Ha, I know that YouTuber. He's a smash YouTuber. From cr- introspective's a smash YouTuber. Not this guy, but he says he's his son. Anyways, fake carbon fiber all over the interior. So this. Oh my goodness. The whole point of carbon fiber is to actually lose weight. And yes, I do absolutely agree with this trend. Like if you're going to have carbon fiber on top of things, like first off, actually replace the bezels. You can do this on your own with a lot of aftermarket stuff where if you have like aluminum bezels or like plastic bezels in your car, you can replace them with carbon fiber. And to be fair, plastic is already pretty light. It just looks bad. That's the reason we don't really like plastic. But anything's better than just straight up faking it. I'd rather have just see it in tier just be plastic than have it be plastic with fake carbon skin over it. And then finally, Arvind Krishna Guru Murthy, I hope I said your name correctly, says oversized grills. This kind of ties into the fake vents one. Like, for example, the newest Corolla and newest Avalon have these monstrous grills that are actually mostly blocked off. Otherwise, the car creates too much drag. It takes in more air than it actually needs. And to be fair, being fake vents also creates drag because, again, you're creating useless indentations where air gets trapped and then has to pocket around where you can just smooth the fiberglass there. And sometimes fake grills or overly large grills make sense if you have, like, performance models where, like, on the lower trims, They'll have the stuff blocked off, but then all the higher trims that are like turboed and actually need the extra cooling because they have an intercooler, they open it up again. But a lot of these cars, like the new TRD Avalon, doesn't even have like super strenuous engine modifications. So its grill never makes sense, either whether it's on the base model or even on the TRD model. Like if the TRD model was twin turboed with an intercooler, it would make sense that it has that big grill and now it's not blocked off anymore. So I definitely think that's a rather strange trend. Other than that, thank you guys. I always appreciate your tweets. And again, if you want to be featured in my videos, make sure to tweet at me. Other than that, see y'all next time. And thanks for watching. Blade Angel out.